Uh, my name is Ian Taylor, and I'm Director of Product Innovation here at BD. And uh, you can reach me at taylor at bd.com if you ever have questions. Um, um, so just want to give you a little orientation of what I'm going to go through here. Basically, um, I'll walk through the data as the title says. I'm just going to take you through the platform, show you what the informatics solution from Flojo is all about in terms of single cell sequencing analysis. And then I'm going to actually show you some live um, examples of how you can utilize the tool and give you a feel for the, for the platform and, and, and how it works. Uh, feel free to drop questions into the Q&A box or into the chat during the session, and I'll try to answer those live as well. So the SeatGeek bioinformatics platform is meant to help researchers perform an iterative analysis on single cell RNA sequencing data sets that is going to follow this sort of a trajectory where we start with some QC and then move into dimensionality reduction on the cells that we've decided are high enough quality and on the genes that are going to give us the best descriptive power. Within that um, data set, we're then going to run some clustering to identify different subpopulations, classification via expression analysis, try and understand what those populations are biologically, and or differential expression analysis, which can kind of give you the same feel for the cells, but in a little more detail. When you've discovered that, oh, you know, maybe this is our population of interest, then you may want to go back and QC that population to find the genes that are going to be best to describe that population. Again, perform dimensionality reduction on the population of interest and so on and so forth until you've really kind of squeezed all the information out of your data that you're, that you're interested to grab there. And we try to make that as easy as possible with some little bit of automation, um, some machine learning, and um, just kind of an intuitive interface, we hope. So on the interface, SeatGeek's workspace looks and feels very much like a Flojo workspace, which is, of course, the predominant software for um, single cell analysis in flow cytometry. And so we think it's a natural fit for a lot of the immunologists um, who are already working with our, with our tools. Uh, it starts with a set of tabs and ribbons at the top that give rise to all the different functions and features that are available within the platform. And within any one of those tabs, you can access things like new workspace, add samples. You can even add samples directly from base space if your samples reside in the base space platform from Illumina. You'll have a layout editor, preferences, all the stuff you would normally expect from a Flojo analysis. The next panel below that, uh, which is where we used to put the groups panel in Flojo, is now a parameter sets and libraries area, which is where you can put and organize gene sets and gene set libraries that you might have collected along your, your trajectory to this analysis. And then that can be really useful for continuing to iterate through your samples and also uh, is going to be a great way for you to look at things like gene set enrichment analysis uh, when you get to the end of your analysis. Okay, and finally at the bottom of the workspace, there's a samples section where all of the subsets of cells are going to live. Um, typically, we're dealing with a concatenated data file, and so the groups aren't as important, but there is a groups panel in that workspace as well, you might notice. I don't usually talk about that one too much. There's also a graph window in SeatGeek. If you double click on any population, it will bring up a graph window. And in that graph window, you've got gating tools. So uh, you can always just gate on populations if that's your kind of more uh, familiar way of analyzing data. There's no reason you couldn't do that, especially if you're doing something like ABSeq, where you've got surface receptor information from the proteome. Uh, however, we do have a lot of different unsupervised clustering algorithms available for SeatGeek and probably recommend checking those out as opposed to trying to draw gates manually on 30,000 parameters. Uh, that sounds tedious. The other thing that's new in the graph window for SeatGeek is the gene view. Uh, and this is another way to help you kind of organize and understand the expression of your parameters. It's going to allow you to look uh, as never before at your parameters as dots in the graph window. So it's kind of a, a big paradigm shift. It's definitely, it's like transposing the way that we view data within the, the workflow. And so that's a really uh, important and I think interesting aspect to SeatGeek that we'll definitely get a closer look at. But just to say there is a cell view and a gene view within the graph window. You can obviously switch between any parameters you want to look at. Currently, we're looking at a couple of drive parameters. TSNE, very popular dimensionality reduction algorithm. Um, that we'll look at in a little more detail. Uh, graph types uh, and graph options are all available in the graph window as well, as well as in the layout editor. 
So the layout editor, um, very powerful place to organize your analysis and to uh, help to convey your message. If you're sharing this analysis with anybody outside your organization, you definitely want to have a really robust layout that kind of describes the workflow that you've, that you've gone through. And when you're finally finished with your analysis and you're ready to submit, uh, we can uh, submit some publications, we can generate really, really high quality, uh, high resolution graphics in the layout editor in SeatGeek. Um, our resolution goes from 256 by 256 pixels all the way up to 4096 pixels. So it's a huge range uh, of graphical resolution that you can get. And here you can see some of those high resolution graphics, just kind of visualizing some quality control that we'll be performing in the platform in oh, 10 minutes. I'm just gonna blast through these slides. So I think um, the next thing I wanna show you is a, an example experiment where um, we've taken some mouse data and, or sorry, mouse cells, run them through the Rhapsody sequencing pipeline to get data. And we've included in there 12 different samples um, coming from uh, different tissues in the mouse model using a really ingenious kind of a tool, the sample multiplexing kit from BD. And then uh, we're able to demultiplex those samples so that in a single sequence, we can get a single run of sequencing, we can actually get information from 12 different types of cells or 12 different, what I'll call samples, um, and analyze them all in CT together, which is very, very handy, uh, leads to some pretty powerful insights. And this is just going to be like, like say, very quick, broad strokes overview of a workflow that you could perform. Doesn't have to be mouse model, doesn't have to be these exact steps. Um, you can skip steps and you can kind of choose your own adventure a little bit, but um, want to break it down as simply as possible for, uh, for the beginners here. So in quality control, the things that we want to focus on are um, high quality parameters and high quality cells. Um, there in the middle, you can see a 3D graph that I've created of library size versus genes expressed. So on the x-axis, library size is showing us the total number of transcripts that's expressed per cell. And on the y-axis there, was the y-axis, now it's the x-axis, y-axis again, genes expressed is the total number of genes that each cell is expressing. You can see there's kind of a correlation, right? The more transcripts you have in a given cell, typically the more genes are gonna be expressed. And that's actually not all biology, it's mostly due to biasing in the sequencing. So we need to do something about that. We need to normalize the counts or the library size per cell. We'll see a little bit more of that in a moment. In the graphs on the left and on the right, we see some information in gene view. Uh, total reads versus cells expressing is sort of like what we see for the cell view in the middle, Instead, uh, total reads is the total number of transcripts per gene, and the number of cells expressing is the total number of cells that express for any given gene, where each one of those little hexagonals is a single parameter. On the right-hand side, though, this is where we're actually starting to filter in this data set for cells expressing and dispersion. So we want some minimal number of cells expressing. Here, I believe it's anything above 10, so we're taking genes that are expressed in more than 10 cells, and we want some amount of dispersion. It's debatable exactly how much you might want there, but um, I'm basically just setting the bar very low and taking most of the parameters uh, for analysis going forward. So on normalization, again, um, just wanna illustrate that we have this really widespread, this is a log scale on both X and Y axis. So um, you can see some of those cells have maybe 10 genes expressed, and others have a few thousand genes expressed. And we wanna move all of those towards a single value in the middle. And we normalize typically to 10,000 counts per, uh, 10, counts per 10,000 reads, excuse me, which means that the effective library size for every cell will be 10,000, uh, regardless of how much sequencing was actually provided to each cell. Again, that tends to be kind of random how much sequencing you give to a, to a single cell in modern next generation sequencers. Next, we're going to take all that information, we're going to feed it into dimensionality reduction to try and understand the data better without having to go through each parameter uh, single file. And so we generate principal component analysis on which we can uh, then do deeper levels of machine learning like UMAP. Nowadays, you can actually calculate components of UMAP in SeatGeek and then use the UMAP components on which uh, you, you, know, you can base things like TriMAP analysis, which is uh, more recent development in uh, dimensionality reduction. We'll see some of that in my demo in a moment. Um, because this data is coming from multiple different tissues, we can actually, actually separate out the 
the sorted liver, the enriched liver, and the lung. The lung is meant in this uh, example to be essentially a biological control because lung is gonna contain many more uh, cell subsets than the liver. We wanna see basically whether or not the sort comes up with a pure set of cells from the liver or uh, how that compares with uh, just simple uh, enrichment and uh, enzymatic digestion versus lung. And so you can actually see that the sorted liver does produce a more homogeneous population of liver cells, whereas a lot of the cells coming from the enrichment do overlap with what we see in the lung. And that tells us that the enrichment isn't doing quite as well. Um, not really the focus of this talk, but just to illustrate some of the analysis that we performed on this sample, very preliminary. Next thing we wanna do is probably start clustering these, um, actually providing some unsupervised clustering. And for that, we actually utilized Phenograph, which is a graph-based a clustering algorithm, also known as a Louvain algorithm for clustering. Very powerful, very nuanced, probably my favorite clustering algorithm, so you'll definitely see some more of that. And again, in this case, I used our iCellR plugin for SeedGeek to look at this in three dimensions because I was curious to see if I could spot one of the populations that was particularly expressing CD19, I believe. Um, let's double check what's on the y-axis there when it rolls around. But um, essentially in this 3D plot, we can look at each of the individual clusters that were generated using the phenograph. So CD38, I sort of forget which population I was looking at here, but um, this is just a recording of my three-dimensional kind of exploration of the data of the clustering. Next, we classified those clusters uh, on the basis of their expression of certain parameters that we know are hallmark for some subsets. And so we looked at FCGR3 for um, controlling monocytes, CD14 for your classical monocytes, CD19 for B cells, uh, CD3 epsilon uh, for T cells, obviously, and then uh, NKG7, we were looking at to see if we could identify some NK cell populations. I leave NK for the last because I'm actually gonna kind of then zoom in on NK cells. I'm gonna imagine that uh, even though this wasn't part of the liver subsets that we were really focused on, let's say we just wanna know more about NK cells where there's no reason in SeatGeek that we couldn't just take the NK cell population and do all the analysis that we just saw before, but using only the NK cells. And so here, um, doing differential expression analysis to figure out what are the most highly uh, differentiated NK uh, populations within our samples. And then I did a trajectory inference algorithm uh, analysis on that using the Monocle plugin. Uh, which just runs the monocle algorithm in R and generates a different type of dimensionality reduction, as well as some independent clustering, some, some a little bit more advanced machine learning. And this is going to kind of tell us the, the trajectory of differentiation for those, in this case, NK cells, but it could be any population uh, you know, you're interested in looking at. And so you can see the different clusters that we identified there. This leads to a whole nother round of analysis, right? Where we wanna look at, well, what's the difference between all of these different clusters in all of the NK cell states and um, really uh, can dig very, very deeply if we want to. But I think that's where I'm gonna leave this analysis, uh, just to kind of show you what's possible. And uh, now I wanna show you some of the resources that are available to you if you're using SeatGeek. We have a huge range of different functions available through plugins. Uh, you heard me mention a few different times the plugins that we were looking at through that just brief example analysis. But uh, one we didn't make use of was batch LR, which is a batch effect correction algorithm, uh, runs the bachelor algorithm from the Sanger Institute. And um, that is available on Flojo Exchange or uh, flojo.com forward slash exchange. That'll take you to the website. Uh, we've also got iCellR, which allows you to create some really nice 3D visualizations if you're interested in those things that you just saw kind of spinning around on the screen moment, uh, a moment ago. We also have a batch-wise differential expression analysis platform inside the iCellR plugin. And so um, that's a really cool one I would definitely recommend people download and, and utilize. Um, UMAP, you saw a lot of UMAP in that previous analysis. Uh, really want to show you some of the newer dimensionality reduction algorithms that we've come up with since then. Um, but also Monocle, of course, a uh, really beautiful analysis tool for uh, trajectory inference. That was the final kind of step there. But there are more than 30 different platforms available through plugins on Flojo Exchange. So um, this is just a small sampling. Uh, I need to thank the team. This is the team that helps create Seeky uh, here in Ashland, Oregon. And uh, I'll just group around our, our new sign there. Um, if you ever need to reach the team, just reach out to seekgeek at bd.com and that get right in touch with us and we'll be back 
uh, we'll be back to answer your questions as soon as possible. Uh, also have a variety of online resources. So if you visit pledger.com, you can download SeatGeek. Anyone can download SeatGeek. And it comes with a host of demo data sets that are, that are also quite cool. You can actually analyze those without any kind of authentication. But if you've got data yourself, or maybe you're starting to mine data off of the NCBI database, you can go sign up for a free trial of SeatGeek that lasts for 60 days. That's available at cloud.plodger.com. So definitely take note of that. Um, docs.plodger.com forward slash SeatGeek is where we host all the technical documentation. So if you're just looking for a little description on how SeatGeek works or how some particular feature works, you can go check that out. And then again, if you, if you need any additional help, reach out to SeatGeek at bd.com. Um, with that, I'm going to go actually just open up SeatGeek for you guys and start loading some data in there and begin a little analysis. And we'll see how far we get through that um, before my time is up. Thanks, guys. Just a reminder, if you do want to reach out to me, my name is Ian Taylor. And uh, my email is just my last name, taylor at bd.com. Um, always happy to schedule kind of one-on-one -on -one demos if you're interested in SeatGeek. Um, that can be kind of fun. But uh, what you'll see here is just a kind of a blank desktop. And what I'm going to do is just fire off SeatGeek. Let's open up another window here. And I've got some data ready here. This is actually another mouse sample, but in this case, I've included some ABSEQ uh, parameters in there. And it's a targeted sample. So what that means is that we've done targeted sequencing. And so there's about 400 different genes in the sample, uh, each of which is specifically uh, chosen to look at uh, immune cell subsets. And so really, really cool um, technology here using the BD Rhapsody system. Um, that I'm going to load into the SeatGeek workspace. Um, you can see again the workspace uh, open there. As a blank workspace, just asks you to drag your samples in. And if you drag a CSV file in there, it will load right up. Uh, CSV is not the only file format that we can accept. We'll take HDF5 files, uh, .mtx files, uh, .st files, .txt files. We try to be very uh, data agnostic. So we'll load data from anywhere. Uh, including exports from Flojo, if you're interested, into the SeatGeek platform. Um, and with that, I'm going to begin the analysis. Let me just remind everyone that we've got a pretty good group here today. If you guys have questions along the way, please feel free to drop those into the Q&A box or into the chat, and I can begin to answer those um, as we actually go th step through the analysis together. So don't be, don't be shy. Feel free to reach out um, with any questions while we're going through this. So now that I've got the data loaded here, um, I just want to go ahead and illustrate what parameters are present in the data. Um, to do that, I can create a new static gene set, and that's available in the genes tab of the workspace. And the first gene set I want to create is going to be our ABSEQ parameters, where I can just filter for AB. And if you've got ABSEQ data, we just put this handy little tag at the end of each of the ABSEQ parameters, which allows me to easily filter for those. And you can see this is a 30 plex. So we've got 30 different samples, uh, sorry, 30 different uh, ABSEQ parameters in the data set. We've also got uh, mRNA parameters, of course, genes in here. So let me go ahead and open up a new static uh, gene set window here. And this time I'm going to add all of the parameters, but I'm going to filter out the antibodies. Remove the selected. And that's going to leave us, of course, with 398. Uh, like say about 400 of these mRNA parameters or gene parameters. Go ahead and save that as well. And now at any point that I want to look just at genes or just at antibodies, I have that available. Or if I need to combine these together at some point, I can also do that. And that'll be our total set of biological parameters within this data set. Um, oh, I think I may have actually included one extra here. There is also a sample ID, which distinguishes the different samples in my file. Let me make sure to remove that. And I'm reminding myself of that um, as I begin to think about the next step, which is normalization. So if I go back to the Analyze tab, you'll see there's a button here for normalization. Again, normalization is going to help to remove sequencing bias that we know exists in these type of single cell uh, sequencing experiments. 
Let me just make sure that when I do the normalization, I'm not including any non-biological information. So sample ID would be something you don't want to normalize because sample ID is telling us where the different samples are. They don't require, that, that, same, that parameter does not require any normalization. So I'll remove the selected parameter. Other parameters to look out for would be things like library. Sometimes library size is written to the parameters for a data file. Any other categorical information like patient or subject or cell type. If any of those pieces of information are already stored in here, we want to make sure to remove them as we start to do normalization. So I've just removed sample ID. Now I can normalize to counts per 10,000, in this case, molecules, because the units in our data file I happen to know are molecules. Sometimes this will be counts per 10,000 reads. And again, that's just setting the effective library size for all 21,000 cells to be equivalent. Okay. Uh, next up, we're going to do some of that quality control that I described uh, in detail before, but now we're going to get even more uh, uh, clarity on exactly how that's performed. So when you first run quality control, you get these three graph windows, one of which shows library size versus genes expressed, and this is where we want to filter out the outlier cells. So anything that's expressing you know, very low number of genes or has a very low library size or even a very high number of genes and high library size, those are kind of questionable events. And I don't want to include those in my analysis because it's possible that they're contributing noise. And so I um, want this to be a very, very clean analysis. So I'm going to, I'm going to do that QC here. If you're worried that you might lose precious cells in the QC process here, it's not a required step. Don't feel like you have to do this if you don't feel comfortable doing QC on your cells. Um, it is definitely recommended. And then you'll notice that uh, as I finish my graph here, or sorry, gating on this graph, and I'm about to close the graph window, I like to remind myself to hit Control L or Command L if you're on a Mac, and that will add the graph that you're currently uh, selecting to the layout editor automatically. And that way I can create kind of the story behind my analysis as I go through this process. Next, I'm going to look at a log versus log scale of total reads versus cells expressing. And so these are, again, gene view parameters. I can tell by the parameter names that total reads is, of course, uh, the total number of reads per gene or per parameter in our data matrix. And the cells expressing is, again, the total number of cells that's expressing. Cells expressing is a little bit more obvious. But just to point out that this is gene view, let me make these dots a little bit bigger so we can really see. As you mouse over those dots, there's another clue that you're in gene view. It's going to actually tell you which parameters you are mousing over. So if you're curious where your antibody parameters are sitting, they're all very, very highly expressed. And that's good. That's where we want to see antibody parameters at. I'm not going to do any filtering on outlier genes here, because in a targeted panel, we've already hand selected the, the genes that we know are of interest. And so we don't need to remove uh, outliers in that case. But I will want to keep that visualization in my layout just to show anybody else who might come along later and look at this analysis. Um, finally, I want to do some filtering on dispersion and cells expressing. So this is going to look very similar to the quality control that you saw a moment ago, where I drop filter somewhere around 10 cells expressing. I want to consider only those genes that are above 10 cells expressing, and also only genes that are above some minimal level of dispersion. And I call this highly dispersed, just my nomenclature. If you don't like that one, you know, use something you're comfortable with. We're shooting for somewhere between 300 and 700 of the most highly dispersed genes, regardless of the data set that you're looking at. I find that that's a really good number to shoot for. It's going to give you really high, uh, high quality dimensionality reduction in clustering going forward. So I mentioned that we're kind of focusing on these top 300 most highly dispersed parameters. Just bear in mind that we're not losing any information by focusing on our attention on those parameters. They're just going to contribute to our dimensionality reduction and clustering. But when we go to do things like differential expression analysis, we're going to consider all of the parameters again. OK, got a question coming in. I'm just going to read it off. Um, gene parameters have 397 genes. Is that fixed? Can one analyze single cell RNA sequencing generated with 10X genomics platform? Yes, uh, that is absolutely a, a great question. If you're dealing with whole transcriptome data analysis, um, which can be generated on a variety of different technologies, including a, a BD Rhapsody has a, a whole transcriptome analysis or a solution, you can analyze that data in SeqGeek, absolutely. Uh, the highest number of parameters that I've ever analyzed in the SeqGeek workspace was 60,000. 
So if you're looking at all the different haplotypes for um, ILCs, for example, there was an experiment done where it looked at about 5,000 cells, each of which had 60,000 parameters uh, included. So it should be no limit on the number of parameters that you can, that you can analyze. Um, uh, there may actually be a limit, but I haven't run into it yet. So it's definitely more than 60,000. Um, the thing though, is that within that, there's gonna be a lot of, um, you're gonna wanna perform a really heavy QC. Even if you have 30,000 parameters, you still wanna drill down to those most highly dispersed set. And whatever that highly dispersed set is, you want it to clearly identify, you know, at most maybe 20 or 30 subpopulations in a first pass through the analysis. You may find hundreds of subpopulations, you know, as you dig into a, a very heterogene uh, heterogeneous sample, but you're gonna to have to drill down into you know, distinct subpopulations typically. You don't wanna get 100 populations the first time you go through your TC analysis. So yeah, 397 is just the targeted immune cell panel, um, which is gonna give you a really high resolution view of those particular 400 genes because we're we're, we, are, um, we are allowing the sequencer to give more reads to each of those genes. Um, and so we, we think we get a higher resolution picture of those parameters. But if you've got whole transcriptome, if you're doing kind of blue ocean discovery, you can absolutely absolutely load your 30,000 gene, uh, gene set sample into CP and start your analysis there. Okay. You can even, if you're particularly focused on a certain subset, sometimes it's nice to do some whole transcriptome data analysis to figure out what panel of targeted sequences you might want to look at um, going forward. Okay, so this is almost the very last QC step that I'm going to perform. The last thing I want to do is go ahead and do uh, a QC based on the sample multiplexing that we performed. Um, so let me go ahead and close this window. And within our QC population, I'm actually going to take a look at our sample ID parameter. So the sample ID parameter is special. It's a derived parameter that identifies the different samples that were combined in sample multiplexing. So sample ID, and you'll see there's a lot of little lines here. That's because there's a ton of samples in here um, coming from two different cartridges of sequencing. Um, if I look at a linear scale, we'll see that they're actually all separated out by a very distinct um, distance, which is integer values, right? The first peak appears at one, the last peak appears at 20. It tells me that there's 20 samples in here, first off. Um, I'm gonna switch this to a histogram so that we can visualize this very easily in the layout editor. And then I'm going to go ahead and identify each one of those samples on the basis of our sample multiplexing. First, I want to create a layer so that I can hide all 20 of those samples if I ever need to. Uh, I'm going to call that layer samples, if that makes sense. And that's just going to include all the samples. But separately from the samples, uh, in a separate layer, I'm going to do clustering. So I'm going to give myself another layer and call that clustering. OK. Now, within the samples layer, I can go ahead and break apart all of the different subsets coming from sample multiplexing, all of our different sample subsets, by going to the workspace tab, looking under plugins, and you'll see I have a long list of plugins here. Uh, don't be intimidated. You probably don't need this many plugins to do an analysis in CP, but there are a few key ones that I'm going to point out here. So the first one is Lex Deconcatenate. Now, Lex is a plugin that comes pre-installed with CP, so no setup required. Um, some plugins require like uh, an install of R, for example. Uh, most shouldn't require much more than that. Um, in this case, Lex just breaks apart all the different samples. And so you can see that some of my samples are actually coming from um, multi, uh, multiplets or undetermined sample types. And so these are actually kind of what I would term low quality cells that we don't want to include in our analysis going forward. So let me go ahead and just find only the highest quality cells via sample multiplexing. And those are gonna be cells coming from samples that we can identify. And so in order to do that, we just select all of these samples and choose Boolean OR gate. And that's gonna give me a new population, which is this Boolean OR gate. It, you'll know it's an OR gate because it has this little icon that looks like a, two overlapping circles there. And that's now drilled us down to a final 18,000 18, cells, which are the cells that I wanna analyze going forward. Um, so this is actually where I should have created my layers. I'm just going to do that one more time. Very easy to do in this case. I can just drag our two layers into my final population of interest. And I'm actually going to rename this something like uh, QC 
SMK because we use the sample multiplexing kit to arrive at this quality control layer. Finally, I'm going to add all of the different samples to my samples layer here, so we'll have them to work with. You'll notice that the SMK uh, undetermined and multiplets are now all zero, so we've uh, effectively removed those cells from the analysis going forward. And I can remove the clustering layer here. Okay, and you can see what the what Lex actually did was it gated on every single peak, and using keyword using a keyword in the data file, it actually knows which integer value belongs to which sample, and so it can automatically identify those samples for us, which is quite handy. And now we're ready to dig into some dimensionality reduction. We've got our final QC set of population or uh, sample, and we want to find what kind of heterogeneity exists within that sample. So let's open up a new layout for that. I'll actually name this first layout something that's descriptive so that anyone looking back at this would know exactly what that was. It was my first step where I performed QC. And when you're done with an analysis, you might have a couple dozen different layouts. So it's really nice to have a little label there that just kind of points people's attention to whatever step you're performing. And in our next step, uh, sometimes I'll do manual gating next, but I think for, uh, for this demo, I'm gonna jump straight into dimensionality reduction. So I call that dim redux, just short for dimensionality reduction. And for dimensionality reduction, we have a variety of different features available. I'm gonna kind of show you some of the newer stuff that we've come up with. And just recognize that there are definitely other ways that you could do dimensionality reduction uh, if you so chose. Um, right now, my, my new kind of shiny pebble is the UMAP algorithm. So UMAP's just done a new release, and we've just done a new release of the plugin as well. In the newest release of the UMAP plugin, you can actually generate more principal components, or not principal components, UMAP components, I should say. And in this case, I like to use 10. And I'm going to use the 10 UMAP components to kind of describe the background structure of the data so that I can do continuing dimensionality reduction in clustering on the basis of uh, UMAP components. What we want to feed into this initial um, analysis, this initial embedding, is going to be our highly dispersed parameters. That's why we filtered down to the highly dispersed parameters, is so that we can do this initial embedding in a very, again, I would say high quality way. Now, if I click OK, it's going to begin to calculate UMAP, and it's doing so on 18,000 cells, so it's not a small population. It may take a little while. Um, while that's running, I'm going to go ahead and set up another layer here for manual gating, and maybe we'll be able to draw a couple of manual gates before we get our UMAP components generated. So I'll call this manual gating, and that's where I'm going to store all my manual gates. That's just a, an, organization an organizational technique that's going to allow me to make this workspace look a lot cleaner. Because as you develop lots and lots of samples, you may want to minimize that set of populations just so that it's clear what's happening in the whole overall workspace. Okay, so if I open up the manual gating layer here, I can start to switch to my other parameter sets. So first thing I want to look at is CD3. Oh, there is no CD3 in this. TCR, which is going to be our proxy for CD3, T cell receptor. And I'm going to look at CD19. Notice that in SeekGeek, there's this added functionality to open up the wings for X and Y that'll allow me to search for different parameters and uh, gives me a view of my parameter sets as well. It's going to help to organize the, the workflow for using the graph window. Okay, uh, looks like UMAP finished calculating and you'll notice it popped up this really nice uh, contour plot of the first two UMAP components. But I want to point out that we actually have many UMAP components now. If I just search for UMAP, We've got actually 10 UMAP components, each with a unique uh, or a, a common shared among the UMAP components, but unique for this run of UMAP, run ID. 2WQF is just a random string of four characters that we tack onto the end of certain parameters. And this allows us to run UMAP multiple times within the same subpopulation, subpopulation if we so chose. For now, this is looking great. I wanna utilize this UMAP for continuing my analysis. But just to store the first UMAP component, I'll add it to the layout editor. If you wanted to add more UMAP components, um, you can toggle to the next UMAP component by holding down the control key. That'll go to UMAP2, which is on our Y axis. Uh, so I'm going to toggle one more time. That's going to take me to uh, UMAP3. So again, holding down the control, or if you're on a Mac, the command key, you can toggle your parameters. And that's just moving down. You'll notice that's just moving down the list of parameters. And it's a quicker way, I think, to, uh, to navigate within the graph window. So. Little pro tip there. 
And that way we can start to visualize, you know, UMAP components one and two, three and four, five and six. And you'll see there's different populations described in each one of these um, versions of dimensionality reduction, these different components of UMAP. And so we're actually going to feed those UMAP components into some other dimensionality reduction like TriMAP, which is uh, probably the hottest new dimensionality reduction out there, if I might say so. Um, if you go to plugins, uh, if you've set up TriMap, you should have a little TriMap icon there. Clicking on TriMap will allow me to select the UMAP components. And I'm going to feed these UMAP components into a deeper dimensionality reduction, which is going to give us the overall view of, of data. This has commonly be, been done by running principal component analysis, followed by TSNE, which is another great way to start to view the heterogeneity within a data set but no reason we can't use some other methods as well and just kind of like push the envelope a little bit, even in a basic demo. So I've selected the first 10 UMAP components that we just calculated. I'm gonna switch my distance function to angular just because I feel like that's a little bit more robust. It's gonna be um, actually more sensitive to outliers, which is what we want in a dimensionality reduction uh, algorithm. And then I'm gonna click okay. Um, after I point out that if you want to read more about TriMap, click on this uh, bioarchive preprint that describes the algorithm by uh, Ahmed et al. Now, TriMap is going to run very similar to um, what we just saw for UMAP. It's going to take a little while, and then when it's done, it's going to pop open a graph window that's going to show us that new embedded space um, so that we can continue, continue on our analysis. Currently, in our manual gating, I am just setting up, uh, let's call this new layer, Gating. I'm just setting up to gate out the T cells and B cells and some of the other populations there using TCR beta antibody and the CD19 antibody. And you can see these populations look very similar to what you would see in flow cytometry, right? That's because they're the same parameters that you would see in flow cytometry, except we didn't have to worry about any compensation. Um, and we're able to multiplex way more parameters. In this case, we're already adding just in a small multiplex uh, 30 parameters. So that's, that's pretty awesome. Okay, and before I can even draw a gate, we've already developed our dimensionality reduction. So you can see TriMap is quite, quite fast. Um, now what I like to do is just move the edge of these plots off the axis by like one tick mark. So I'm just gonna do a minus on both sides. This is purely for aesthetics, but you can see that our, our contours are running off the edge of the graph window. And so I like to, I like to move those more into view. And I'm gonna go ahead and add this to our layout where we're doing dimensionality reduction, because after all, this is the next form of dimensionality reduction that I'm interested in running there. And you can see this is kind of describing a lot of different heterogeneity in the samples. We're already expecting to find lots of different subpopulations within there. Now let me go ahead and customize the uh, graph a little bit. Uh, that gives me the option opportunity to show you guys that uh, we can go high resolution here. So 256 is kind of where Flojo has been for the last 20 years, but we can now go to 1024 pixels, and that's going to be much higher res. It's going to make our dots much smaller. So as a consequence, we have to be able to change the dot size uh, to a much finer degree. I also want to add the legend so I can show you all about the dot shapes that are available uh, here. And I also like to simplify my X and Y axes. So I'm just going to remove the tick marks. Those are not biologically meaningful. And I'm just going to add a very simple name to this plot. I'm going to call it TriMap. I think that's much more, you know, just pleasing to the eye. Uh, okay, so within the legend, as I mentioned, we can do things like change the color, of course. But here in SeatGeek, we can also change the dot shape. So now all my outliers are going to appear as little hollow circles. Um, I can also change the line thickness of that hollow circle. And that's also going to change the line thickness of the contour plot. This is kind of like a standard that I've started using um, for all my plots. So take it if you like it. Um, I think it's a really nice way to view the to view the data with that high resolution and, and the outliers shown with little hollow circles. Okay, at that point, I'm done with the legend. I'm just going to close that. But I am going to create some different copies of this trimap. I'm going to use this trimap embedded space actually as the backdrop for many different comparisons across the analysis. So I want to make sure that I have a few different copies of that kind of hanging out here. I'll put the furthest one far away so I can leave some space for legends in between. Next up, um, let me finish off that manual gating. I'm only going to gate a few subpopulations here by hand because I don't think that's the most efficient way to find subpopulations in um, modern analysis of this single cell data. 
Um, but I'll show you that in the customized access window, we actually have some extra additional options for selecting parameter sets. Frequently, as in the case with ABSEQ, you typically want to scale all of your AppSeq parameters together using a common scale type. So what I like to do is filter for the AppSeq parameters, select them all, and then transform using the ArcSinge uh, uh, transformation or scale. And then you can adjust the width basis so that you can just kind of see the negative and positive peaks a little bit better. And we like to group the zeros with the rest of the negative uh, cells because these are actually all one population of negative uh, uh, TCR, basically non-T cells. So bimodality is generally what you're looking for in a parameter, not always. Sometimes there might be other modes in there, but uh, in this case, certainly we want to get all those negatives kind of grouped together. And that's going to be the case very similarly for all of the parameters that are in the AppSeq parameter set. Okay, when ready, we click apply to selected parameters, and that's going to give us the view that you see here. Okay, another question coming in, which I'll just read out and then try to answer. What's the advantage to use trimap as opposed to, or angular distance as opposed to Euclidean? So trimap angular versus trimap Euclidean. Honestly, the difference is gonna be super, super minor. Uh, they're gonna look very similar whether you use a Euclidean distance or an angular distance. Where it makes a bigger difference is things like UMAP. Uh, UMAP seems a little bit more sensitive to the dis distance function that you utilize there. So good question only done a bit of benchmarking myself. So if you find that uh, you are seeing better results with one of those other distance functions, you know, please reach out. We'd be interested to see what you come up with. Within this uh, bivariate plot of TCR versus CD19, again, I just want to gate out my TCR positive T cells. Yeah, that's a little bit redundant to say that, but makes sense, right? And then I'm going to gate also CD19 positive B. Everything else, I'm just going to term TCR CD19 double negative. Just going to be simple about that. And notice all of this is within my manual gating structure. And you can imagine with 30 different antibodies, we can create a very deep and very wide um, set of gating trees here. And we may want to minimize that. And so that's why that manual gating layer is there. It makes it a little bit easier to, to hide some of the stuff that we're not so interested in seeing at all times. Okay, and before I close this graph, let me again also make sure to add this to the manual gating uh, layout, and that way any manual gates I add in here, we'll be able to check them out later. Uh, one thing though, while I've got my manual gating front of mind, I can actually copy one of these TriMap embedded space uh, plots, throw it up here, and then overlay by the B and T cells and kind of see where the B and T cells separate out just to make sure that we're getting good separation between those populations. And indeed, you can see some islands are maybe have a couple of little outliers in there, could be down to my gating scheme not being perfect, as I'm probably not very perfect at doing manual gates. I don't think anybody is, is perfect at that. But um, within these populations, I'm just going to kind of color them and give them the, the shape that I like. And uh, we can easily visualize the T cell populations there and the B cells uh, over there on the left. Cool. Continuing on um, to some more advanced stuff, let's try some clustering. So there's many different clustering algorithms for SeatGeek, and I want to walk through a couple of them just to give you some options. And then finally, I'm going to run Phenograph on the clustering layer there. So if you go to the Analyze tab within SeatGeek, you'll see there's a clustering platform which contains the k-means clustering algorithm. The, the big disadvantage to k-means is you'll have to choose the number of clusters that you expect to find in a data set. And um, sometimes that's a big downside, so you may want to, you know, not use k-means if that's a problem for you. It's also a pretty basic type of clustering, to my mind. Um, it's fairly old in terms of algorithms. People have known about k-means for a long time. Sometimes old and simple, though, can be a, a benefit. So we like having k-means there as a native platform for doing clustering. But otherwise, um, you know, in terms of native clustering platforms, that's about it uh, currently. Other clustering algorithms are all going to be available through plugins. So let's look at some of the plugins. Um, basically, I want to draw your attention to XShift, which is a clustering algorithm that runs in Java. So it's very easy to set up. Uh, it's also pretty fast and fairly robust. Another type of clustering might be available if you're running the Surat pipeline. 
I'm not going to run through the Surat pipeline today because we're applying some of the more advanced features here like TriMap that aren't available in Surat. But if, uh, if you're reading about single cell sequencing analysis, and you'll probably run across Surat first thing. The Surat algorithm from the Satija lab is a really beautiful sequencing pipeline, uh, analysis pipeline that you can run to generate dimensionality reduction, differential expression analysis, and clustering all kind of in one go. And, it, and the type of dimensionality reduction it will provide is either UMAP or TSNE. And so that's available as a plugin. If you want to run Surat, you can do that on your data set in SeqGeek uh, if you like. We've also got Monocle here, which does a, a type of clustering. You've already seen some of those clusters. I don't think I'll actually be illustrating that now, but um, I will show you the phenograph, which is available right here. So if you choose phenograph, um, what it's going to ask you to do is feed in a set of parameters. And just like we fed in UMAP parameters for doing the dimensionality reduction, we want to stick with that kind of baseline description of the overall high parameter data using those 10 UMAP components. Given that we have a huge number of cells, I'm going to set my K fairly high. I'm going to try 100. Uh, the default of 30 is good for very small, uh, small samples, or if you're looking for very, very small subsets. Uh, in this case, I would be happy if I got back a dozen clusters here. So I'm going to go ahead and try with 100. I want to name each of my clusters just PG for phenograph cluster. And now if you click OK, it will begin to run sort of in the background. You'll see this plugin node appears and says calculating. But when it's done, this plugin will delete its own plugin node and pop up a graph window that shows us the clustering parameter that's used to identify those different subsets. OK. Now we're doing a little bit more of the weighting game. So let me look back at my manual gating and think about what other kind of populations we might want to pull out very quickly here. And so clearly we can look for CD4 antibody and CD8B for the cytotoxic T cells. And you'll notice in this sample, we've got a large population of double positives, which is the one I like to gate out first. Um, these are there because we have uh, thymocytes or uh, thymus cells in this in among our samples. And so you do have a lot of double positives there in the um, uh, early, early T cell development. So I usually just call this CD4, CD8 double positive. And in the bottom right, I can gate on the CD4 single positives. Let's call them CD4 positive T, because we've already gated on TCR. Probably could have done the same for our CD8s. Call this CD8 positive T, or rather I could have done so for the CD4, CD8 double positive. If I'm not happy with this, and it turns out, you know what, I would like to add a T, just select your population, hit Command R or Control R if you're on Windows, and you can rename that population, no problem. Okay, this is gonna also go into my manual gating analysis. And I'm gonna go ahead and remove that layer name from here, but I'll leave the subpopulation is already listed here, TCR uh, positive T cells, so that we know exactly where this set of gates comes from. So we can kind of trace the origin of the, the gating tree as we, as we go through that. Okay, not going to go any deeper on T cell subpopulations, but you can see that there's a huge number of uh, combinations of bivariate parameters that we could look at if we, we so choose. Okay, we got a lot of clusters from Phenograph. This is a little bit more than I was expecting, but it's okay. We can handle a large number of clusters if we want to. Um, we could also choose to go back and rerun this with a higher K. Already 100 is pretty large, so wouldn't necessarily want to do that now. Also notice the larger you set your K value, your K nearest neighbor's number in phenograph, the longer it's gonna to take to calculate. So uh, just bear that in mind as you're starting to set your K very, very high. Uh, although it will give you larger clusters, uh, a sm smaller number of large clusters as opposed to a lot of very small clusters as we see here. Ah, another question coming in. I'll read that aloud and just give a little answer to that. Is it possible to gate cell types based only on RNA expression? So certainly it's possible to gate on the RNA and people will do that, uh, I find pretty frequently for a certain set of markers that people are very interested in. You know, usually in the, in the samples that you're looking at, you have a particular set of populations that you wanna find and you might have an idea of what gene or genes are expressed there. And so you can gate even on a gene set. So if you had 100 genes that describe the program of expression that happens in 
I don't know, hematopoietic stem cells, then you can look at those hundred genes all at once and gate to try and identify the, the cells that are positive for that, for that program. One thing I want to note there is that sort of similar to my manual gates on antibodies, maybe even worse, the cutoff here for where positive and negative sits in terms of a threshold is a little bit muddied. It's not entirely clear. And we see that when we look at the T-SNEP, right? There are certain T-cells that I identified which probably aren't T-cells. We can tell that based on their separation or segregation here in the embedded space. You're gonna have a much harder time getting clear separation when you're getting on uh, transcriptome features or RNA parameters or genes. Um, so that's kind of one of the downsides to, to RNA is that it is not usually giving you a very, very clear cut bimodality between populations, at least that's been my experience. Particularly, you're gonna have a lot of false negatives. Um, but where that can be nice, if you've done clustering, you can sometimes point to a place where a certain gene is enriched. For example, say I'm looking for Tregs and I gate on FOXP3 positive cells. Well, any cluster where I see a high, high number of those cells occurring, maybe not every single cell is exp expressing FOXP3, but I still trust the clustering that probably those cells really are Tregs, especially if that cluster is very tight and looks like it's kind of you know, uniquely segregated. Um, so it can be useful, but it's not going to be probably your gold standard for identifying subpopulations, if that makes sense. Basically, I would want to do some unsupervised clustering to back up my findings if I'm doing any kind of manual gating in uh, data sets with this many parameters. Okay, back to the dimensionality reduction layout. Now I've actually got another thing to overlay here, which is our different clusters. So I'm going to select all 33 clusters. It's going to become a long list. Sorry about that. And I'm going to overlay them. And we can see that we are actually finding, you know, a huge amount of heterogeneity in here. And it looks pretty valid. I mean, I can see that there are um, distinct subpopulations described by, I can see it visually in the embedded space, that there are distinct subpopulations described by these clusters. So. Uh, and we kind of know that these are T cells and we kind of have an idea that these are probably B cells, but I want to know much more fine grained information about the expression profile of each of these clusters. Well, that's actually pretty simple to do in CQ. Um, let me go ahead and set my background color to some light indistinct gray so that it doesn't shine with that kind of yellow color there. I didn't like that. Um, to check the differential expression analysis profile of all 33 clusters here, um, I wouldn't want to do that manually, although we could, uh, and I might show that in a moment. But instead, I would like to do this batchwise. I want to find the upregulated parameter set and the downregulated parameter set for every single one of these 33 clusters. And so to do that, I'm going to run this plugin called ICELR. ICELR is actually a whole pipeline of analysis, very similar to Surat in a way, that is developed out of um, NYU by this brilliant bioinformatician, Reza. I believe his paper for ICELR was actually just um, just published or uh, just became a, you know, an accepted manuscript. So that's actually wonderful. I uh, want to all celebrate with Reza on that. Um, our plugin just incorporates a couple of those tools, the most powerful of which in my, in my experience is this differential expression analysis. So this will do DEG analysis for you uh, on the fly for whatever um, clusters or categorical parameters you've identified. In this case, I want to do this for just the genes. So I'm going to select my gene parameter. Otherwise, we could use all the parameters and do differential expression analysis of, of all parameters. But selecting your parameter set of interest is really nice because then that can kind of focus whatever genes you're interested in and do your differential expression analysis just on them. Um, down below, you see there's this thing called a clustering category parameter. And this is where we have to actually select our clustering parameter, which, as you'll recall, is called PG cluster or PG cluster for phenograph cluster. Next, you can set your thresholds here. So if I want to set a full change of 2.0 as my bare minimum, I can do that. I tend to set this a little bit lower. I'm going to go with the default of 1.7. And that way, if there's things like transcription factors, I'm more likely to pick them up. They're usually not being um, differentially expressed quite as much because of obviously a small change, you know, transcription factor can be a big amplification in effect downstream. And once you're ready with that, you can click OK and it will begin to calculate. Now, there's nothing too fancy when this finishes uh, calculating. The plugin is going to disappear. The only thing that's going to pop up is we're going to get some new parameter sets contained and organized within collections at the top there. OK, too many clusters here. 
Let me go ahead and just minimize this clustering layer. There we go. And within this workspace, I want to start looking at the different samples. So I mentioned right off the bat that this data is coming from sample multiplexing, right? So we've got actually two cartridges already pre-combined here where, you know, different replicates are coming from, um, I think replicates come from different cartridges. So we have a, an adipose control, an adipose high fat diet. We have a bone marrow control, bone marrow high fat diet. You can see we're doing sample multiplexing. You can immediately see the different tissues that we're using, adipose, bone marrow, spleen, and thymus. And you can also see that we're comparing control versus high fat diet in the mouse model. So this is a really powerful data set, uh, very beautifully uh, collected by collaborators in a different department of um, BDB Life Sciences. Um, so big thanks to that team that collected this, this absolutely spectacular data set. Always enjoy showing it to researchers. Um, anyway, with these annotations, we can actually start to deal with the samples um, as either different tissues or different um, conditions. In this case, I want to look at the different tissues. So let's combine all the adipose um, cells together into one population. And for that, the Boolean gating is indispensable. I'm gonna do the same thing for bone marrow. I'm gonna do the same for spleen. And then finally, I'm gonna do the same for thymus. And the last step here that I would recommend is these Boolean gates create a very long population name. And I wanna actually name those something a little bit nicer, like just, it could be total adipose, but I think adipose is simple and easy enough to understand. Similarly here, I'm just going to call the bone marrow, bone marrow, spleen can be spleen, and thymus. Oh, I think the calculation was finishing and throwing me off. So for all of the clusters that we generated, that we generated in Phenograph, we now have an upregulated and downregulated uh, gene set collection. So you can see downregulated parameters are here, upregulated parameters are here. And if you disclose that gene set collection, you'll see a list of all the different gene sets, starting with one and then 10. But um, going through our list of 33 different clusters, if we wanted to now kind of just examine, I'll pick the very first example here, the gene expression profile for cluster one it'll tell us something about what cluster one is doing and maybe what type of cell that is or, or, um, or what's going on with that, with that population. And so I like to order this in descending order in the table here. Uh, notice this full change in Q value is just giving you some measure, some metric with which to um, understand the differential expression. It looks like MMP9, which is sort of ringing a bell, this may be B cells. In any case, um, you can see the whole list uh, of genes. And if you order from highest full change to lowest, it's very easy to see those top most highly differentially expressed genes for cluster one. I think that's super, super handy. Oftentimes, this is exactly what you want to export to you know, collaborators or as part of a publication. So you can actually export this parameter set, or you can just simply select the rows of interest and hit Command C, copy those onto your clipboard, and paste them into Excel if that's where you're headed with this analysis. Okay, um, so that's a little bit on the gene set um, differential expression analysis, rather. Finish renaming these subpopulations, just left with the thymus. And now I kind of want to see how different these different subpopulations are on the basis of tissue. We expect them to be quite different. So we may expect that the the uh, trimap is actually separating out by tissue. And indeed, you can see things like the thymus where there's a, you know, a real enrichment for T cells is indeed enriched for T cells. So that's just a good gut check. Um, similarly, like we have a lot of B cells in the spleen here and in the bone marrow. Um, let me again, make these a little bit more customized. I like to change the, the shapes for all of these different clusters normally. Unfortunately, there is no preference yet to set these shapes to like a default in case you're always using hollow circles, but I think that will come at some future iteration of the, of the platform. So don't like this color particularly. Let's do purple. Yeah, that's a little bit better. Okay, so now we have some basis for understanding the heterogeneity within each of these subsets and between all of these subsets. Now, if we wanted to start asking questions like, What's the difference between high fat diet adipose and uh, 
uh, I'll, I'll say for lack of a better word, a healthy um, adipose tissue. And so to do that, um, what I need to do is segregate out our different um, high fat diet adipose samples from the control adipose samples. And we have an N of two, so there's two different samples for each. How can I, how in the world can I actually deal with that? Well, it's quite simple. Um, there's a couple of different ways that you can divide off your different um, conditions in this case. You're just gonna, one is to just drag all of these populations into the adipose and then create more Boolean gates. So I'll select the controls together and create an OR gate. There we go, not so hard at all. And I would just wanna name this something descriptive like adipose control. And similarly for the high fat diet, we'll do Boolean OR gate and call this one, creatively enough, adipose. That diet. And now, if I want to see what the difference is between the adipose control and the adipose high fat diet, I can do a pairwise comparison between just these two populations of interest. And that's uh, made very easy in SeatGeek. You just double click to open up a graph window, start things off. Oftentimes, that's the first step we take. And in that new graph window, I'm going to switch to gene view so that we're able to view the differential expression of those genes between our populations of interest. Now on the x-axis, we recommend researchers put their control population. And in this case, there's a handy search term I can use, which is just control. Or better yet, if I want to be specific, I can search for adipose control. And we should see my adipose control is right here. That's the population, the full gating path to the adipose control population in the workspace. And now what's being plotted in this histogram is all of the genes, right? We're in gene view. So every dot, if there were dots, or every point in the histogram would be considered as a single gene. And across the x-axis is the mean expression of those genes for this population, okay? So this is kind of a way of looking at the expression of our control population, but not that useful for differential expression analysis until we start to look at adipose high fat diet on the y-axis. This is what we call the test population sometimes. So you put your control population on the x-axis and your test population on the y-axis. Why the y-axis, you might ask? Well, as you go up here, you're literally talking about upregulated genes in the test. And as you go down, you're talking about downregulated genes in the test. So if nothing else, maybe that will help you remember to put the test on the y-axis and keep the control on the x-axis. Okay, but this is only showing us correlation, right? Because this is, me I told you before, this is mean expression of this population and the on the on the x-axis is the mean expression of our control population so that tells us something about what's overexpressed or what's underexpressed in our test but we really want to do rigorous differential expression analysis don't we we want to do some we want to see some fold changes and some p-values or in other words we want to see a volcano plot so this is a volcano plot illustrating the differential expression of our high fat diet adipose tissue versus our control. And so in here, if I want to draw my own thresholds, I can just draw a gate there and type in, this will be the up in adipose high fat diet versus control. And on the other side of one, one is where we see, where we would see co-expression, except you can see there's lots of differential expression now, uh, lots of differential expression going on between these conditions in this tissue. Here I'll uh, just call the the opposite side of that uh, volcano plot, down in adipose fat diet versus control. Cool. And lastly, I like to add both of these graphs to a new layout, just so that I'll have a little record of that differential expression analysis that I did. It also gives me an easy way to kind of visualize the differential expression that exists here. Again, if you wanted to put this into a, a presentation or, or, sh or show this for a, a collaborator, and I'll call this DEG of adipose. Simply select the graph window, hit Command L, that'll add it to the graph, or add it to the layout editor rather, and do the same thing for the correlation. Now the parameter names here need a little bit of work. Uh, I probably want to customize these to make something very terse as opposed to having the full gating path there. It's a little bit long for me. Um, but 
again, just starting to scratch the surface on this analysis, there's tons more information that we could mine out of here. Um, honestly, if, if this were my data for you know, a, a research project, I would be looking at this data for, for a month before I got through all of it, at least. Um, and I have been looking at this data for a long time, and I still find new cool things almost every time I, I take a look at it. Um, with that, I think I've actually run a little bit over time, but I'm happy to stay long, um, mostly driven by any questions that you might have. So please feel free to throw questions into the Q&A box or into the chat for this webinar, and I'll get those questions answered uh, pronto. Otherwise, uh, for those that need to run, I want to thank you for staying a little bit extra and for uh, your time today. It's always great to get a little audience and talk about SeatGeek stuff with, with folks. Um, do reach out if you want to do a one-on-one -on -one session at any point. Again, my email is just taylor at bd.com. You put that in a text box here. Ah, there is a question coming in. Great. Uh, can, can we learn a little bit about gene set enrichment analysis, essentially is what's being asked there. Uh, and sure thing, let's, let's walk through a little demo of gene set enrichment analysis. Um, before I do that, I actually meant to show just saving the workspace. I haven't saved the workspace once this whole time. It's usually a good practice to save more often than not in case anything bad should happen. Um, so I'm going to save to my desktop and I'm just going to call this uh, like that diet demo my initials. And then I always like to leave a revision number because I give my workspaces different revisions as I go through the analysis and produce different versions of that saved file. Okay, so to start the gene set enrichment analysis discussion, let's talk about how gene set enrichment works in SeatGeek in kind of broad strokes. I'm going to create a special layout here just to kind of draw some pictures, which is just the pictures that I like to draw for showing gene set enrichment analysis. So imagine that this oval, I was gonna say circle, but this oval, this egg, is all the possible genes. It's a Venn diagram that I'm about to draw here. And this circle is all the genes that a given organism can express. So this, in this case, for our data, would be mouse. All the mouse genes in, in, the, in the world of a mouse. And I call that, what we call that, the, um, uh, the model library, or just simply the model. Gene set model. How about model gene set? That's more descriptive. I'd like to actually make this one a bigger text box because it's real important. Let's make that gigantic. Cool. Next, I'm going to draw some little, you know, smaller ovals here. And this oval is going to represent, I'm going to make lots of these. This is going to be a gene set from a library. So what's a gene set library? Well, a gene set library is something that's been painstakingly curated with many gene sets, sometimes thousands of gene sets that describe various different biological processes. So this is a gene set again, um, gene set library describing a function. Sometimes if I'm drawing this little illustration, which I've drawn before, I will um, include the function that this gene set might hypothetically be describing. But um, in this case, I'm gonna you know, forego that. And I'm gonna group this together so that I can utilize a copy of that in a moment. So group these things. Can I set their object fill to none? I think that's, I have to ungroup it to do that. In any case, uh, I want to create a copy of this and put that over here. Because just keep in mind, this gene set from the library is only describing a small part of the total possible gene sets, but it can't be outside the total possible gene sets, right? It can't be out here because then our model is incomplete. So typically these gene sets all fall within that uh, model space. So we'll create a bunch of these things. And ideally, you would describe the entire organism in some way through these gene sets and gene set libraries. Also notice I've intentionally made one of these gene sets, now another one of these gene sets, overlap. So these things don't have to be unique. You can imagine that there are certain processes, certain pathways that rely on gene sets that are involved in other pathways. So there's a very complex network, a web of, of different processes happening here and different, uh, different gene sets from the library will overlap and that's totally fine. 
Um, next, I'm going to draw our discovered gene set. So gene set enrichment analysis is all about figuring out what is this guy? This is differential expression analysis, right? This, I'll just call that, that that's a good name. So this is, this is our DEG, or better yet, discovered DEG. And it's gonna be typically a much smaller piece of the pie. Um, let's group these together again. This would be good practice. And I uh, wanna point out that, you know, this guy is not gonna typically sit just within one gene set, because that would be very, um, that would be too handy. Instead, oftentimes these are not overlapping entirely one gene set. They might even overlap three, but I'm gonna intentionally move this maybe a little bit further to the right here. That's hard to make them overlap exactly three. Okay. So the idea being, um, because this gene set overlaps many gene sets from the library perhaps, we're gonna have some probability that this gene set is actually coming from this process, this process, and this process, but more likely coming from this process. So that's what gene set enrichment analysis is telling us. Um, now let's see it in action. Um, to do that, I actually have to load a model gene set. Because we're dealing with a targeted data set, we only have 400 genes, and that's not the model for mouse. So we need to load the mouse model. My mouse model is in my demo data, under next generation sequencing. And I have a special folder called gene set libraries, where I keep a few different kinds of gene sets. And one of them is the murine uh, model or mouse model for uh, doing differential or doing gene set enrichment analysis. And I wanna load that into the workspace so that I can use it in a moment. Next, I wanna figure something out about cluster one. And let me uh, do that by right-clicking and choosing enrichment test, where I'll need to first thing select my model. So in this case, I don't want to use the sample. If you're doing whole transcriptome analysis, it's probably okay to use your sample because you'll have 10,000 or 20,000 or 30 or 60,000 genes in it. But in the case of a targeted sequence, we want to choose a different model. Targeted sequencing data set, I should say. Next, we'll choose a library. And don't forget, uh, don't, don't, don't worry, I haven't forgotten. There's a question coming up here that I think will be answered right away. The question is, um, is there a way, is there a plugin specifically to analyze the pathways for differential expression and not for, for differential expression? So pathway analysis can be done through gene set enrichment uh, analysis. So I'll try to show you a, a good, let's see, demo data, let's try and see. Uh, if I look in my special gene sets directory here under, mouse, I have, for example, all of Go. So this is the mouse Go annotations uh, GMT file, which I just downloaded from the Go database. And anyone can go download those, those gene sets if you want to take a closer look. But your gene set can be curated for pathway analysis. So if you want to figure out what pathways are looking like they're probably active in a particular gene set discovered, check out gene set enrichment analysis. Um, to answer your question more specifically, we do not have a plugin that does pathway analysis on differentially expressed genes at this time, but that's a great idea. Um, we also don't have, I would say, an algorithm for doing that kind of analysis, although I'm sure one exists. So if you have tools out there that you want to apply to this kind of a question or this kind of a problem, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, Seeking at BDA.com is probably the right place to go, or you can also reach out to myself. And uh, we're always looking for more feedback on the types of analysis, the types of tools that researchers really want to apply to this type of data. So if you know of an R package or an algorithm that does great pathway analysis, we could potentially turn that into a plugin for you and for the rest of the community to utilize in Seeking uh, in just the way that you described. Okie dokie, I'm gonna go ahead and select that gene set library and that's gonna fill in my gene set library area here. The p-value cutoff, um, probably want this to be pretty stringent because the p-values that are returned when you're asking this type of question, what are the chances that my discovered gene set comes from any one of these gene set libraries that it, that it may overlap? Um, you wind up coming back with very, uh, basically low probability that that would happen by random chance and therefore a very high p-value. But um, I also sometimes set this very, very lenient because who knows? I'm not sure where this 48 set, of, this set of 48 features is going to lie. And so you want to uh, sometimes set that to be a very low confidence level. 
But we'll let that uh, run for a moment. And when it's finished, it should provide us with a table. Perfect, just in time. And now uh, it's already gonna be sorted in terms of ascending order where your lowest p-values or most highly significant um, gene sets from the library are identified. And in this case, you know, some things are gonna be pretty generic. Regulation to an external stimulus is not, is not um, very descriptive. Immune system process, maybe even less so. But sometimes as you dig deeper, inflammatory response, uh, chemotaxis, leukocyte migration, neutrophil chemotaxis, you will, come, you will sometimes come across a really nice uh, gene set that describes what you're looking for. Now, this is again, I'm testing against the gene set that I've downloaded from Go, which is just all Go terms. And that's great if you wanna cast a really wide net, but if you have more curated questions, you want a more curated gene set library. And you can actually curate these yourselves. Let me show you how you can create a gene set library within SQL. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this. Now that we've seen what gene set enrichment returns, you may ask, you may well, well ask, how do I create my own library out of some gene sets that I found maybe in the literature? Well, it's very simple. You select your gene sets of interest if they've been defined in the workspace. You can add gene sets to your workspace simply by dragging CSV files in there into the gene sets area. And then in the genes tab, choose export. And you'll have two different options for export. One is CSV file, which just generates a CSV file for every single one of these gene sets. So that would be a large number of CSV files. I wouldn't want to have to go through that by hand. Um, or you can do a GMT export. And this is the gene matrix transpose file format that we use for gene set enrichment uh, as a gene set library. So this will create your standard gene set library file format, which you can then use in further SeqGeek analyses. Or if you're publishing your gene set library somewhere, you can publish the GMT file and it makes it convenient for other researchers who might wanna pull that down and, and utilize it. So yeah, gene set enrichment analysis is definitely, a, oops, don't actually wanna create that one because these aren't even annotated. So who knows what clusters what, what each of these clusters represents this time. I probably wouldn't want to publish this until I've annotated each of these gene sets. Um, but yeah, great question. Uh, not probably one of the tools that I use very, very frequently, but uh, it can be handy for certain, certain types of analysis, certainly would want to do gene set enrichment. <clears throat> okay. I think uh, with that, again, I want to thank everybody who came to this webinar and, and stuck through the whole thing. Um, I, I do hope that you guys will find this tool very useful. And uh, as you have more questions, that's kind of expected. So um, please don't hesitate to, to bring those questions to us and we will try to address them as soon as possible and um, you know, with the most, pos most robust possible answers. Okay, thanks everyone for joining and uh, we'll see you for the next one. Bye now.